want to introduce to you right now a close friend and brother. To me, he is one of the best interpreters of song and spoken word. My friend, Pastor Marvin Wyman. Be blessed. Everybody say amen. God, God has spoken. So let the church, let the church say, say amen. Yeah. Can I get a witness? Let the church oh. say amen. To what his plans are. Let the church to what his word say says. Amen. church say, oh, lift your hands wherever you are and let the church Good morning. Good morning. It's morning, right? <laughs> Good morning, Uptown Church. We're so glad that we are here this morning. Uh, welcome if you are watching online. Uh, we're here at the top of Weiss Hospital's parking garage. It's a balmy day in November in Chicago. So let's lift up the name of the Lord for that. Praise him. <laughs> we are always grateful for wonderful weather when it's supposed to be freezing cold out. So uh, let's just praise him today that we can be together. If you'd stand with me, I'm going to open up with Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. I just want to encourage you, church, uh, this morning, obviously, there's something really great about being right out here, live and open, 
Uh, the light is shining very bright. And uh, I would just encourage you to worship the Lord in freedom and enjoy this time that we're together. And also to encourage you that even in a time of being in a pandemic, being in a place where we're supposed to be social distancing, where we can't be close, we are still the light that can shine bright in this world. And there, there's still opportunity to draw people to Jesus, who is the hope that we have during this time. So I just wanna encourage you this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We are so grateful for the opportunity to worship you, Lord, together here in person. Thank you, God, for this weather. Thank you, Lord, for all the good that you are doing in the midst of a very hard year. We praise you for the victories. We praise you for the good things. We praise you for the provision that you've done in many of our lives. We praise you for those of us who have been able to stay healthy. We praise you for those of us that we know who have recovered from COVID even. God, we thank you that you are still moving and doing great things in and through us and through the church. Father, we worship you in spirit and in truth today together, and we thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. So the weather's going to start getting cooler. Coronavirus cases are going higher. The opportunities for us to be together like this are going to be fewer and far between as we move into winter. So let's really take advantage of this opportunity to corporately worship the Lord together. Those of you that are here, those of you that are joining us online, uh, worship, uh, worship the Lord from your homes, uh, in those living rooms, wherever you're at. But let's just really uh, focus our attention on God and let's just show him our appreciation and really just uh, be present in this moment uh, and just take full advantage of it. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Yes, his love for me. Through the sun sets free. Oh, it's free. But he brought me in Oh, his love for me Yes, his love for me Through the sun sets free Oh, it's free indeed I'm a child of God Yes, I am In my Father's house In my Father's house There's a place child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last. Free at last. He has ransomed me. Oh, his grace runs me. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the Son I am. 
in my father's house there's a place for me i'm a child of god yes i am free at last he has ransomed me oh his grace runs deep while i was a slave to sin jesus died for Yes, he died for me. Yes, you died for us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that you've died for us. And you set us free. You set us free today. Who the Son sets free. Let's lift it up. Oh, it's free. Yes, I am. Thank you, Lord. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Let's just worship Him and praise Him this morning. Sing to the King. Right, we can put our hands together and clap a little bit. For his return, we watch and we Come, let us sing. Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. Sing for his returning again. For his returning, we watch and we pray. We will be ready the dawn of the day. And we'll join in singing with all the redeemed. Satan is vanquished. To the king, 
would sing to our King. seen you move, you move mountains, and I believe I'll see you do it again. You've made a way when there was no way, and I believe I'll see you do it again. I'll see you do it again. I've seen you move, you've moved the mountains, and I believe I'll see you do it again. You've made a way when there was no way, and I believe I'll see you do it again. thought by now they'd fall, but you have never failed me yet. You've never failed us, Jesus. Waiting for change to come, knowing the battle's won. For you have never His promise still stands. Your promise still stands. Oh, great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. And this is my confidence. You've never failed. Sing it again. Your promise still stands. Still in your hands, and this is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. And I know the night won't last. Your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again. Thank you, Jesus. Because Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your Praise again, cause your promise still stands. Your promise still stands. Oh, great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. Oh, this is my confidence. You've never failed. Your promise. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. You've never failed. promise still stands over oh sing I've seen you move I've seen you move you move the mountains and I believe 
I'll see you do it again. You've made a way where there was no way. And I believe I'll see you do it again. I've seen you move. You move the mountains. And I believe I'll see you do it again. You've made a way where there was no As we continue to worship the Lord, I'm going to invite Evans, uh, Pastor Evans, to come up, and he's going to facilitate communion for us. Hopefully everyone has received elements when they came in. If you do not have communion elements with you, would you just raise your hand? Uh, Debbie or Terry will be over to uh, administer that to you. But uh, Pastor Evans, would you come, and would you bring us to the Lord's table this morning? According to scripture, we as Christians partake in the Holy Communion and remembrance, and, and remembrance of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ that was broken and poured at the cross. In John 6, verse 53 to 40, 54, Jesus tells us that unless one eats his body and drink his blood, we have no life. He adds in John 6 verse 54 to 56 that his body is food and his blood is a drink. Whoever eats his body and drink his blood abide in him and he will do so with us too. By receiving the spiritual flesh and blood Christ lives in us and us in him. We also learn that we must take the Holy Communion since only with the life of Christ in us we have eternal life and will resurrect on the last day. Let us pray before we receive communion. God, thank you so much for your presence here this morning. Thank you for dying for our sins and give us a new life in you. Thank you for all uh, for providing for our family, for our friends, for our community. Oh God, as we're going to eat the blood that present your body and drink the cup of salvation, we actually got to be in and in, in, in our in, in here. Uh, lead us, God, protect us as we're going to eat the bread of life and drink the cup of salvation. I'm going to invite you to open the clip parts and to have the bread hole in your hands. As we are partaking in the Holy Communion this morning, remember, we are joyfully proclaiming the Lord's death and his resurrection until he comes again. Let us eat together the bread of life. Out the other parts. And let us drink the cup of salvation. Let us pray. God, thank you so much for your salvation. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for providing God. And thank you for your presence being here even when we don't feel you or don't see you at work, but we know that you are active, you are moving. You are you are working hard on our behalf for us and you are here this morning. Thank you God for loving us unconditionally. We leave our family in your hands. We leave our church in your hands, God. We leave our pastors. 
We ask you God to continue to pro provide for our family, continue to protect us, God. We leave the rest of the week in your hands. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. 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 And amen. Would you go around in a socially distanced way and greet somebody, staying six feet apart, keeping your mask on, but let's smile and say hello to one another. Okay, well it's great to see everyone that's here today and thank you to everyone who is joining us online uh, that was not able to make it. Uh, it's great to be able to worship the Lord together. The bulletin that you received whenever you came in has not only the song lyrics in it, but it also has the QR code on the back for the church announcements so you can scan that QR code with your phone and you can read about all the upcoming announcements that are going to be that are happening here at Uptown Church. So please take advantage of that. Also, you're going to find two cards, two thank you cards inside that bulletin as well. Uh, we are trying to build up our stock of thank you cards for Weiss Hospital and Heartland Health. We are delivering with everybody's coffee, uh, uh, coffee and uh, treats for them every week as they uh, serve us our community during the pandemic. So we are actually out of thank you cards right now. So we need everyone to write one thank you card to Weiss Hospital, one thank you card to Heartland, encouraging the workers there for all that they do, and then leave those thank you cards with us here whenever you leave, and then we will be able to distribute those each week, one each week, to both uh, organizations. We are so thankful for our healthcare community and what they are doing uh, during this pandemic for us as they serve faithfully and make so many sacrifices. As everyone is pretty much aware of probably by now, Joe Biden has been named the pre presumptive president-elect of the United States. And I want to make us all, I want to remind us that regardless of who you voted for and what political affiliation you hold to, you are welcome here at Uptown Church and you, are, uh, you belong here and you are part of the Uptown Church family. No matter who becomes president of our United States, we as the church need to remind ourselves of the responsibility that we have, not just as citizens of this country, but as citizens of heaven. We are part of God's global church, and we have a biblical mandate on us that we have to fulfill no matter who our president is. The first thing that we are called to do biblically is we are to pray consistently for our president and for other civic leaders. So I want to remind us as a church that as we move into this new administration, that we must continue to pray consistently for our president, our vice president, and all of the other leaders uh, that are leading our country. Secondly, as citizens of heaven, we must cooperate where we can cooperate and we must prophetically oppose where we must prophetically oppose. And we do this based on biblical truth, justice, compassion, and ethic. Third, not only do we pray for our leaders, not only do we cooperate and support where we can, not only do we oppose where we must, 
We have to continue to live with Christ as our supreme authority. Christ is in charge of the church. Christ is in charge of this world. And that doesn't change. We put our deepest trust and our deepest hope in him. And then finally, we stay faithful to putting our faith in action. As administrations change, laws change, climates change, cultures change, things happen. But no matter who is in charge, as the church, we have a mandate on us to reach the lost, serve the poor, promote peace, fight for justice, fight for justice, and help to usher in God's redemptive kingdom on this earth. So no matter what the political climate is, no matter who's in charge of our government, no matter how the government thinks or feels towards the church as an institution or us as a people of faith, we do not waver from our mandate. So as we move into the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021, we remind ourselves to pray for Joe to pray for Kamala. We remind ourselves to cooperate, support, and encourage the best we can, but if we must oppose prophetically at times, we do that. We continue to live with Christ as the head of our lives and of the church, and we stay faithful to the mission, continuing to put our faith in action. Amen? All right, we are in the middle of our Now What sermon series, and it is a sermon series that is taking us through the life of Joseph in uh, the book of Genesis. And we are going to settle on Genesis chapter 41 today, so if you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to Genesis chapter 41. Using Joseph's life as a guide, we have been asking this question, now what? Now what as we face challenging, life-altering situations that can easily disrupt and disorient us? How do we live and respond when life throws curveballs at us, catching us off guard and off balance? Already we have discussed getting thrown into a pit. What do we do? When we have been moved into unfamiliar territory, what do we do? Now what? Facing temptation, Handling unfair situations. These are all things that we've talked about, and Joseph has faced all of these things. So now today, we move into the next section of his life, and we are going to talk about how we are to live and respond when we find ourselves thrown into the presence of power. Next week, we are going to discuss how we are to live and respond when we are given positions of power. We're going to talk about navigating the dangers and pitfalls that come with success and the spotlight. But today, Joseph is not yet acquiring power. He finds himself in the presence of power. If you've not been following the series with us, just very quickly, let me recap. Joseph was thrown into a pit by his brothers. They hated him. They sold him into slavery, into Egypt. He was a slave in Potiphar's house. He rose the ranks of um, uh, Potiphar's servants, and he became in charge of the entire household. Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him. He fled from her. She lied to Potiphar that, and said, Joseph was the one that seduced me, so Potiphar had Joseph unfairly thrown into prison. And in prison, Joseph is given charge over the other prisoners, and two prisoners that come into the prison are the chief baker and the chief cupbearer for Pharaoh. And both of them have dreams, and they come to Joseph, and Joseph is able, through the power of the Spirit, able to interpret those dreams. And they, he, Joseph asks these two, when you get restored, if you get restored back to Pharaoh's court, will you remember me? Will you remember my unfair situation here? And will you tell Pharaoh about it, and will you get me released? Well, the baker wasn't able to do it because the dream said that he was going to have his head cut off, and that did happen. So Joseph's hopes really rested in the cupbearer, not in the baker. The cupbearer forgets about Joseph. And the, as we enter into our chapter, it says Joseph was in prison for two more years because the cupbearer forgot about Joseph. What's going to happen is Pharaoh is going to have a dream. And when Pharaoh has his dream, it's going to spark a reminder in the cupbearer to be like, oh yeah, Joseph 
interpreted my dream, this guy in prison, I think he can interpret yours because none of your people can do it because Pharaoh's getting agitated and he wants to know what the dream means. So here we are in the point of the story where the cupbearer tells Pharaoh and Pharaoh has Joseph taken out of prison and brought into his presence. Joseph taken from a prison cell brought into the presence of the highest power in Egypt. Each of us are already navigating different power dynamics in our lives. In our families, in our work, our community, with our friends, etc., you name it. In all of different places. We all swim in familiar waters where we can somewhat discern where we have power and where we don't. For Joseph, as I mentioned, when he was a slave, he was a subject of Potiphar. But he was also over the servants who were subject to him. For a time, Joseph was a prisoner under the authority of the warden. But he was also given authority over the other prisoners. And I think most of us can relate to this type of power dance and fluctuation in our life. There are some places where we have authority and power, and there's other places where we are subject to authorities and powers. And we sort of are comfortable in that. We've sort of, sort of settled into our roles, and we're sort of making it through life knowing where we sort of stand a little bit. But what do we do when power dynamics suddenly just shift and change completely? Because for Joseph, there he was, knowing where he sat under the warden, then he was over the prisoners, and then all of a sudden he is thrown into the court of Pharaoh in front of this immense power, feeling like he probably had no power. What do we do when we are thrust into a place where we are given audience with or have sudden access to a new level of human power? What does it look like to represent Christ in that kind of environment? What should we be paying attention to and what should we be prepared for? What could potentially go wrong and what should we be looking out for in that moment so that we honor the Lord and stay faithful to him? It's like in school, you're in your classroom dealing with your other classmates and your teacher and then you get called into the principal's office. That's a new ball game. It's like at work, dealing with your direct superiors and your coworkers, and all of a sudden the owner of the company wants to talk to you. It's like living in your community, showing up somewhere, and you're given a microphone to face an alderman, a mayor, or a governor, and they want to hear your opinion on something. Whatever the scenario might be for you and I, it's going to be uncomfortable, it's going to feel unfamiliar, it'll be daunting, it can be scary, we're going to feel weak, powerless, and the intimidation factor is going to be quite high. This is the situation that Joseph finds himself in. And you might be saying, Jeremy, I don't know why you're preaching about this this morning because that's never going to happen to me. You don't know me. You don't know my life. I'm just an ordinary person. That's never happened, and it's never going to happen to me. My response would be, oh, really? Because I think Joseph might have said that exact same thing while he was in that prison cell. Sure, he had dreams earlier in his life when he was a young kid, but now he had been thrown into a pit. He had become a slave, and he was in prison now. Maybe those were dreams that were never going to be fulfilled, of like people, the stars bowing down to him, all the things that he told his brothers and made his brothers hate him. But you see, this is what God does, and you and I need to be prepared for the work that God does. And what is it that he does? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul writes that God prefers to use the foolish, weak, despised, and powerless in this world to accomplish his grand, large purposes. The more unlikely that we think something like this could happen to us, the more prepared you and I need to be. Because if we think that we're a nobody, we are in prime position for God to use us. God uses the nobodies in this world. God's not really interested in using the somebodies. And in fact, it is God using the nobodies to confront the somebodies. So maybe we all need to pay attention this morning instead of writing this type of a message off. Because we need to be ready and prepared for when God is going to put us in front of authorities and powers, asking us to confront them with his message. 
what I'm going to share with us today isn't intended to be formulaic, okay? It's not going to apply to all situations and circumstances where power dynamics are at play because power dynamics are, they're varied, they manifest and they play out in various ways, factors of age, race, gender, title, affiliation, money, family, location, beliefs, all of these things create unique challenges that need contextual wisdom. There isn't a one-size-fits-all approach that you and I can take when we are trying to navigate all the situations of power dynamics that we face in our life. But the focus today, as we look at Scripture, is specifically on how you and I might appropriately handle the moments where God gives us specific access to specific people with specific power in order to accomplish a specific purpose. These moments might come in your job. These moments might happen through a chance encounter in life. You might be volunteering or serving somewhere and the opportunity arises. You could be involved and engaged in your community, in your local community, and all of a sudden you have this opportunity. I don't know where, when, or how it's going to happen, but this morning I want to make sure we're equipped like Joseph, when we encounter a Pharaoh in our lives. And I'm going to offer three principles in the form of three questions for us today. Three principles in the form of three questions. The first question is, when God positions us in the presence of power, are we able to decenter ourselves? Are we able to decenter ourselves? Genesis chapter 40, verse 23, the end of the previous passage. The chief cupbearer, however, re entered into Pharaoh's court and he forgot about Joseph. You see, before Joseph ends up in Pharaoh's court, the chief cupbearer is restored first. And he had a promise to Joseph. He promised him that he would remember him, the lowly prisoner. But this promise goes unfulfilled. As the chief cupbearer ends up back in the presence of Pharaoh, the question I have was, was he so wrapped up in his own good fortunes that he just forgot completely about Joseph? Did he potentially think that bringing Joseph up as soon as he got back into the good graces would cause Pharaoh to become upset with him again and he'd end up right back in prison? What was the right move to make? You see, when we end up in the proximity of power, it is really easy to lose sight of everyone else, everything else, and focus solely on our own survival and our own advancements. You see, this is what power can do. Just being around it can make us highly aware of our own vulnerabilities, our own lacks, our own frailty, and we are tempted to just function out of self-protection mode. Being thrust into the presence of power, it can make us become extremely enamored and in awe with it. Joseph, you can imagine being in the court of Pharaoh, looking around and seeing all the opulence, all the people, all the deference to Pharaoh, and it can just really knock you off your feet. It can disorient us. And not only that, it can create deep cravings to arise in us that we didn't even know that we had because we had never been in the presence of such power before. But all of a sudden, we're there, and it's like, I want this. I want to be around it. It can change our perspective, our values, and our commitments. At its most basic level, the danger of power, and power is not all bad, but the danger of it is it wants to corrupt us by tempting us to place our self-interests over and above the common good. That's one of the main ways that power corrupts. We want to make it all about ourselves and not about others. I don't know if you've ever been in the situation before where you've been like the lowest person on the totem pole at work and you're just sort of like finding solidarity with the rest of the other workers that are in your position and all you do is complain about upper management 
And upper management doesn't really get it, right? They don't get you. They don't know what you're going through. They don't give you the supplies that you need. They're overworking you. They don't understand your perspective. Like, they are in a position of power, and they're not thinking about you as the, as the person under them. I don't know what they're doing in that office, but it's not focused on us. They're focused on something else, and they're probably focused on maintaining their control and power and appeasing the, the bosses above them. The bosses above them matter more than you do. Right? So what happens? You're all in solidarity together, complaining, grumbling, making it through. You've all become friends. And then one of you gets promoted. All right? One of you from the group gets the raise, gets put into the somebody left, and they get moved up. And that person's like, don't worry. I'm not going to forget about you. I've seen all the problems. I know all the problems. This guy, they did it wrong the entire time. I'm going to get it right. I'm in your corner. I'm on your side. That person gets promoted. They move into the bigger office. They get the higher pay raise. And guess what? Nothing changes. For some reason, when you get into that position of power, other things matter. Other things become more important. The little guy matters less, and the upper guys matter more. Self-preservation kicks in. You know, politicking, you name it. All sorts of stuff happens. Perspectives change, and Nothing changes. There's a great Bob's Burger episode. I don't know if anybody watches Bob's Burger, but it, it was an episode called Twintrepreneurs, and it's about their class putting to, having to start a business, and they hilariously just play out this entire scenario between upper management and lower management as these kids basically start their own business. So check it out at some point. When you and I are accustomed to having very little power, just being around it and brought into the proximity of it can make us do crazy things that we never thought we would ever do. The influence and hold that it can have over us is strong. The temptation to center ourselves, our needs, and our wants, the desire to appease those with greater power out of self-preservation is real. The question is, will you and I be ready when we enter into the presence of power to decenter all of that? to just not focus primarily on all that junk and think about the Lord and think about others. We get a clue to Joseph's mindset as to how he came into the court of Pharaoh in Genesis 41, 15, and 16. And it reads there that Pharaoh has called him in and says to Joseph, I had a dream and nobody can interpret it, but I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. What do we see here? Pharaoh is giving the credit to Joseph, saying, you're a dream interpreter. I hear you can do this, and you have this power. Joseph replies to Pharaoh, I cannot do it. I cannot do it, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. So instead of trying to make himself look good and impress Pharaoh, instead of trying to take the credit, he quickly points to God and not himself. Joseph is not interested in maneuvering, playing a pol political game. He's not trying to jockey for position. He is deferring to God as the great one instead of trying to make himself look great. He is recognizing that God has brought him into the courts of power to be used for a specific purpose. And this isn't about himself. It's about the Lord. Joseph demonstrates humility. Humility. And if you and I have a fighting chance to walk into the halls of power, to be in the presence of power and not be corrupted by it, we have to instill godly humility in our lives. Other ways that Joseph could have centered himself, I think, is if he maybe chose a barter system, maybe a quid pro quo type thing where he's like, all right, Pharaoh, yeah, I can interpret this dream, but before I do that, what's in it for me? What are you going to give me if I do what you're asking of me? Joseph doesn't do that. He doesn't try to divert attention away from Pharaoh to bring Pharaoh's attention to the injustices in his life. He doesn't say, okay, Pharaoh, before we get into your dream, I really wanted the cupbearer to tell you what was going on in my life, so let me just give you my life story really quick before I get into the dream. He doesn't do that. He doesn't draw the attention to himself. He keeps the attention and the focus on what Pharaoh has asked him to do. 
Now, due to the extreme power dynamics that were at play here, we could probably argue that by Joseph not doing any of these things was probably in his best interest. So we could actually argue that, well, this is probably Joseph in self-preservation mode because if he would have done anything else, he might have gotten the treatment like the baker got, which is the beheading. So I would imagine that Pharaoh could have been a pretty scary guy if Joseph knew that that type of behavior was happening. But I think we can also confidently and safely say that when Joseph entered Pharaoh's presence, he didn't do it with a mindset that focused on himself, what was best for him, and would be in his own interest. I think that his repeated pointing to the Lord and to the sovereignty of God tells us that Joseph wasn't trying to accomplish something for his gain here. He decentered himself. And you and I must be prepared to avoid the self-centering trappings of power when we enter into the presence. If God calls us as ordinary people to do extraordinary things in front of powerful people, we need to be ready for the glory of the Lord to shine brightly through us, and we cannot make it about ourselves. So the second question that I have the first question is, is when we're put into the presence of power, are we able to decenter ourselves? Are we able to resist the temptation of what power wants to do to us? And are we able not to focus on ourselves? The second thing is, is are we willing to speak the truth? Genesis chapter 41, verses 28 is where we'll start. Joseph looks at Pharaoh and says, It is just as I say to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. In this rare moment, Joseph has been given the ear of a powerful person. He has found himself in a situation where the most powerful person in the land was willing to listen to him, the powerless slave and prisoner. It is the Lord that has opened the door for Joseph, and God wants to use a slave and a prisoner to show his power. But what is Joseph going to do in this moment? Is he going to honestly share what God wants him to share, or is he going to try to sugarcoat it a little bit? Because, as you and I know, powerful people, they like to surround themselves with yes people. And it seems like yes people get the best treatment when it comes to people of power. People of power want someone around them that they can trust, who doesn't f seem to come across as disloyal, and these people, these yes people, they get the privileges that come with being close to power. And when anyone disagrees, it seems, and this doesn't go with everybody, but it's a trend that happens, but when people disagree with people in power, what happens to them? They get pushed out of the inner circle. They get ostracized. And it might not even be that they're trying to uh, reprimand the person in power. They might be trying to help that person, but that person says, I don't want anyone around me that disagrees with me. So there's a fear that if I say something to you that you don't like to hear, I'm going to get punished for it. Joseph, first of all, does anyone know what I'm talking about? Has anyone ever experienced this before, right? This dynamic. Okay, Joseph, knowing the interpretation of the dream, I can imagine that he might have been tempted just to share some of the good parts and maybe not some of the bad parts. Pharaoh, in seven years, you're, for seven years, this land is going to be bountiful under your reign, O Pharaoh, because of your greatness and because of your goodness. Seven years of famine are going to follow, but let's not talk about that right now. Let's just focus on the fact that we're going to be doing great here for the next seven years. There was probably a real danger that Joseph found himself in by sharing something with Pharaoh that wasn't positive. What if the bad part of the dream, what if Pharaoh took that personally and he decided to punish the messenger because of the message? I was reminded this week 
of the word that God gave Samuel when God called him as a child. Remember that old story of Samuel sleeping? Samuel, Samuel. Little Samuel goes running to Eli. Eli, what is it? You know, what do you want? And Eli can't quite figure it out. Until finally Eli said, well, maybe the Lord is trying to talk to you. And the Lord does talk to Samuel. And we know we remember that part of the story, but if we really look at what God actually tells Samuel, it's really an indictment against Eli and Eli's family. And here we have Samuel, a young boy, under Eli, a father figure. Samuel, a young apprentice, under Eli, the priest who was mentoring him. There were so many power dynamics at play here where Samuel was the weak one, Eli was the strong, powerful one. God had spoken to Samuel, and it was a word of judgment against Eli and Eli's family. And Eli comes to Samuel and says, all right, boy, what did God tell you? You can look at 1 Samuel chapter 3. Eli really presses him in verse 17 and 18 and says, what did God say to you? Do not hide it from me. May God, be, may God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything that he told you. Can you imagine? He's like tightening the screws here on Samuel. He's really putting the pressure on Samuel. You better tell me what God told you. Can you imagine this little boy truthfully and honestly speaking up to this man, to this grown man, and declaring a prophecy of judgment against him and his family? But verse 18 says that Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. How committed are you and I to speaking the truth? when we come in the presence of power, authority, and privilege? What compromises are we willing to make or do we make? Do we tell itching ears what we want them to hear? Are we trying to play a game so we can get closer to those people in power, to maybe share in that power when we know there's something wrong going on there? They're not treating people right. They're not doing something that they should be doing, but we're just going to keep cozying up to them and not sharing the message that needs to be shared because we know that to tell the truth can bring swift and severe consequences against us. As we're discussing this idea of speaking truth to power, I think we need to recognize that Joseph didn't just inundate Pharaoh with all truth of his choosing. Pharaoh didn't get up and say, all right, Mr. Pharaoh, I've lived in this country for this number of years. Not only am I going to interpret this dream for you, but I am going to give you and tell you everything that's wrong with this country everything unfair and unjust, I'm just going to like spray truth at you like an AK-47. He doesn't do that. I'm sure he could have. I am positively sure that Joseph knew the ins and the outs of the unfairness of the Egyptian culture, being on the lower end of that, the receiving end of it. But he basically brings the one bullet that God asked him to bring. He says what God wants him to say. Our commitment to speaking truth must be practiced within the boundaries and the restraints that God places on us in the moment. Some of us need to hear that this morning. Some of us have the ability to share our opinion and our voice in many different places, stages, environments, and we're just out there shooting from the hip everything that we think is truth and right and good, and we just, God has not put it upon you and I to fix every single wrong in the world today. You and I are not the Messiah and you and I are not the Savior. What God has done is he's called us to be faithful and obedient to share the word that he's given us. And what we need to do is we need to be spending time in prayer and discernment with the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, what should I be sharing right now? What word have you given me for this moment, for this person, and for this time? That is who we are supposed to be. So some more discernment and some more restraint on our end might be the medicine we need for the day. God wanted Joseph to interpret the dream. There was no need for Joseph to address anything else in that moment. Joseph had an assignment. You and I have an assignment. We need to be sure 
that we are focused on the assignment that God has given us. And there are so many good things that we can involve ourselves in and do. There's so many good messages that we could share. We could lend our voice to so many things, good things, right things, God-honoring things. But the question that I keep coming back to for us, especially as a church and as individuals, what is God calling you and I to specifically in this moment, in this time? Will we be faithful to it? And then will we be faithful to the next assignment that he gives us? It is so important that we speak up and speak out. Please hear me this morning. I am not saying that you and I should not speak up and speak out. It is vital that we do. But it is also just as important that we are using prayerful discernment and are being led by the Spirit of God to say what he wants us to say when he wants us to say it. Amen? Finally, the final question the first one was, are we willing and able to dissenter ourselves? The second one is, are we willing to speak the truth? And the final question is, are we willing to help and serve? Joseph interprets the dream, and then he moves on without any prompting in verse 33. And he says, and now, Pharaoh, look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance. Collect all these foods during the good years and then store them up under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. And this food should be held in reserve to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that this country may not be ruined by the famine. As soon as Joseph is done speaking truth to power, interpreting the dream, he just goes right into providing counsel and wisdom to Pharaoh as to what he thinks needs to be done next in order to save the country from ruin. He offers a plan. He tries to help. He tries to serve Pharaoh and ward off the destruction of these people that are not his people. This is spectacular. I think this is probably one of the most amazing parts of the story. Joseph could have easily said, All right, Pharaoh, here's the interpretation of the dream. Now you know the problem. I've done my job. Time to do your job. My work is done. Peace. I'm out. He could have said, Pharaoh, I have told you what's going to happen. I would love a release from you now and I would love to go back to my homeland. Joseph could have basically smiled or smirked at Pharaoh, gleeful in the fact that judgment was going to be coming upon this country in this way, seven years of famine. He could have just told Pharaoh, here's the dream interpretation, now send me back to my cell, chuckling, being delighted in the fact that there was upcoming devastation about to be released on this country, the very country that had enslaved him, oppressed him, and imprisoned him. But instead of doing any of that, Joseph offers help and service. I just, I mean, this is amazing to me. The amount of maturity in order not to just wash your hands of the situation and the problem, in order not to just be sort of happy and glad that these people were going to get their comeuppance. Who uses that word anymore? Joseph chooses to operate with compassion again. This is the amazing thing about Joseph, and if we're going to learn a lesson from him as we're going through his entire life, is that Joseph always chooses the path of compassion. We're going to see in a few weeks that his very brothers are going to come to see him in Egypt. The very brothers that threw him into a pit and sold him into slavery. And Joseph shows compassion on his brothers. This is who Joseph is. And if you and I are ever questioning, what is my next move? Now what? Compassion and mercy is always a good route to go. Are you and I willing to help and serve out of compassion when people who hold power over us mistreat us? 
Are we willing to help save a majority culture from ruin when we have experienced oppression from that majority culture? Are we willing to help an economy that has treated us like a commodity? On one hand, you've got Jonah, who wanted God to destroy the foreign power. And on the other hand, we've got Joseph, who wants God to save the foreign power. In 2014, the Buffalo News wrote a story of an American medic who saved the life of a high-ranking Taliban fighter in Afghanistan. This high-ranking Taliban fighter was well known for giving orders to execute civilians. The man's name was John Burick. He had been brought to Afghanistan to treat American soldiers and Afghan soldiers who had been injured in fighting. But he wasn't prepared for the very first battlefield patient he would ever encounter over in Afghanistan. Because it was this Taliban soldier who had been placed on what was known as a dead cart. A dead cart is an old farm wagon that was used to collect all of the, the, the dead bodies after a battle had been fought. The Taliban soldier was actually pretending to be dead from his wounds because he didn't quite know who was picking him up. Was it an enemy or an ally? It was an Afghani soldier who was fighting the Taliban who noticed that this man was alive and he called for the medic. And reading from the article now, it says that Beric ran over and pulled the young man out of the cart and onto the ground where he bandaged him to stop the bleeding before attaching two IVs to replenish his fluids. As Beric performed first aid, he could not block out what the Afghan soldier had just told him, that the man he was saving was a member of the Taliban. The Afghan soldier said that he was a really bad one, too. He was the one who gave orders to execute civilians. Beric's conflict was, here I am saving the enemy, but also thinking I'm saving a life. Beric said, I knew this man wanted to kill me. I could see it in his eyes as I worked on him. He kept looking at my weapons, my M16 rifle and my 9mm pistol. I told him, don't you touch them. I am trying to save your life. He just kept looking at me. And while I patched him up, other Afghan soldiers chimed in, urging me to end this man's life, and they kept saying, you should just kill him. Even now, six years later, Burick says he relives his actions on that day, and he keeps coming to the same conclusion that it was right for him to save the man's life. I'm glad I made the decision that day to save his life. I've been trained to save lives, not to take them. And I know this is an incredibly extreme example, but the overall point I believe it conveys is here we have one person's willingness, an incredible willingness, to have compassion and mercy upon the very person and people who want to kill him and harm him. We see David demonstrated this with King Saul. David had a chance to kill King Saul, the powerful ruler who wanted him dead. Even David's men encouraged him to kill Saul while he was sleeping in that cave. But David just couldn't do it. He spared Saul's life. Joseph had been powerless every single day since coming into Egypt. He was either a slave or a prisoner. And now here he is, offering counsel and guidance for how the country might be saved, the very country that oppressed him. Finding ourselves thrown into the presence of power can be scary, alluring, paralyzing, energizing, you name it. Power's ability to corrupt is strong and dangerous. And if you and I are not prepared and careful, we will be driven towards selfishness, dishonesty, and cold-hearted behavior. That's what power wants to do to us. But just being in the presence of power, just being around it, just being in the proximity to it, it can cause us to mismanage the opportunities that God gives us when he calls us to be his representative. I started the message this morning by pointing to 1 Corinthians 1, where it states that God chooses the foolish, the weak, the despised, and the powerless to accomplish his great purposes in the world so that he alone gets the glory. This is what God did with Joseph. 
God used Joseph to do something that even the most esteemed, powerful people in Pharaoh's court could not do, something Pharaoh, he himself, could not even do. God used Joseph to do it. God did the same thing with Moses. God did the same thing with Esther. God did the same thing with Daniel. God did the same thing with so many other people through history. Who are we to say that God is not going to do something like that with us, through us, in our day and in our time today? Because how many of you know that power is corrupt? We are living in a time and a day where power is being abused. And God needs his church, his people, to stand up and do something about it. Which means God could use you and I at any moment, in any way, at any time, and we need to be ready so we do not mismanage or miss out on the opportunities that God has for us as he demonstrates his glory and his power through us, ordinary, weak, broken people. God continued his trend of using ordinary people when he sent Jesus to this earth. Yes, Jesus was the Son of God, but God sent him to the margins. God sent him among the poor, and God sent him to accomplish his will far from the center of power. Jesus did not do what he did because he acquired power. Jesus did what he did far from the seat of it. Jesus doesn't show you and I a pathway for how we can gain power and use it. God, he shows us how we are to seek after God's presence, and it is God's presence where we find the ultimate source of authority. In the midst of of Jesus' life here on earth, Jesus found himself in the presence of human authorities and powers. And he never once operated in a way where he centered his own desires over the will of the Father. He never once didn't speak the appropriate truth that needed to be spoken, and he never once refused to be compassionate and merciful to those who were powerful. Jesus was connected and submitted to a higher authority. Jesus was living for that higher authority, something beyond, something greater than all earthly influence and control, and you and I have access to this very same power and authority through Jesus Christ. All we must do is submit and surrender our lives to him. We can access that very power, authority, and presence, and God can use us the way he used Jesus, Joseph, Daniel, Esther, Moses, the list goes on. You and I do not need to crave earthly power There is no reason to be intimidated by it. We don't have to fear it or believe it to be necessary. We don't have to put our hope in it. All we have to do is stay rooted in Christ, focused on the Lord, and allow him to accomplish his great plans and purposes through us right here in the midst of the powers of this world. Are you willing? Are you ready? Are you listening? And will you be obedient? Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, here we are. Lord, we are nothing great or grand. We are a small new church here in Uptown. None of us are important, powerful people in this world. But Lord, you have important, powerful tasks to do through us. You have called us. You've given us an assignment. You've given us your mission. Lord, will we be true to it? Will we do what you've called us to do even when we find ourselves in the presence of human powers and authorities? Lord, will we decenter ourselves? Will we speak truthfully? And will we serve compassionately? Lord, speak to us now right in this moment, to each of our hearts. Lord, give us the confidence and the courage to know that you do want to use us. You will use us. You have called us. Let us search you and seek you for that will, for that discernment as to where we should go, what we should say. 
Let us not write ourselves off. And let us obediently follow you, prepared so that we do not mismanage the opportunities that come our way. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? We are going to sing one more song today, and we are going to sing the song, How Great is Our God. God is great. He is the ultimate power. He is the ultimate authority. We bow the knee to him. We worship him alone. So let's sing together. Lord, you are great. We worship your greatness. We surrender to it. We submit ourselves. Use us this week, Lord. Give us your words. Give us your opportunities. 
allow us as weak, powerless people to confound the wisdom and strength of this world. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. amen. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Next week, we will probably be back online, but uh, this is beautiful weather. This has been really amazing. Um, stay socially distant. Keep your masks on, but let's uh, hang out a little bit. Greet one another. Thank you all that worshiped online with us, uh, and we will worship again together next Sunday. Thank you. Benediction. I always forget at an outdoor service. Thank you. So, Lord, Give us opportunities this week to help disrupt suffering and mend what is broken with the hope of Jesus. Where there is violence, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is poverty, help me to offer the resources I have. Where there is addiction, may I pray for the power of your freedom. Where there is loneliness, use me to foster community. And where there is an overabundance of convenience, Teach me to sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen.